a subject dear and near to my heart, um, office design, office um, flowcharts, office maps, if you will, with Robert Wilkinson. He joins us from the mainland, um, and he is going to tell us about his work on office maps and office trends and all the changes uh, in offices that we have seen during COVID and that we will see going forward. This is very exciting because so many Americans, so many people in the world spend their occupational lives in offices. So this is not a small subject. This is universal. Hi, Robert. Thank you for joining us today. G'day, Jay. Thank you very much for having me. Much appreciated. So um, how did you get involved in this kind of study? Because this is, a, you know, it's a, it's a challenging study. And more than that, it's a changing study because it's always changing. It's, it's the world in which we live and spend our time. Um, so every day you got to get up in the morning and say, hmm, how is this changing? <laughs> it's it's so true, you know. Uh, the last couple of years has been a massive uh, shift, as everyone knows, uh, due to COVID. From uh, the, the the usual nine to five, everyone goes into the office every day, does their bit, and goes home. To to this um, this huge change to more of a, a hybrid work environment, and I think it, it's not. It's not quite as dramatic as you think. I think it was already happening prior to COVID on a, a smaller scale. Um, that because of technology changes and the, the fact that you could actually work from home and still be productive, quite a few companies were moving in this direction already. But it's just over the last two years where it's been forced upon absolutely everyone, where it's exploded, and you're seeing this huge change in, in how workplaces are, are being put together. And it, it's everything from, you know, um, how HR works to uh, how your facilities team works to how much real estate you need. There are, there are changes across the entire organization and it, it's pretty spectacular. I, I was telling you that, um, you know, I practiced law for a long time and our, um, um, I guess the plurality of our clientele were downtown office buildings. We represented a lot of them. And uh, we found that over the years, and this is over a long period, uh, that the national companies, the big tenants, we're reducing the size of their spaces. You're right. This is this is something that has been taking place for a long time. And they've decided as a matter of the bottom line, they'd probably want to pay less rent. Um, and, and they have to design their spaces differently. So an awful lot of redesign um, and reorganization of employees and, and staff members and equipment and all that. It's been really remarkable to see uh, how they have changed and how much better it is. But let me ask you this, Robert, to look at the dark side of it. Um, there's something you lose too, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's the smell of the grease paint and the roar of the crowd, or maybe it was the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you don't have the, the eyeball to eyeball, um, you know, the watch, the emotive qualities of the person you're dealing with. Um, don't you lose something? I mean, it's a really good point. And I think there's been a, a few studies already around this. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, you know, is, is what you lose, though, offset by what you gain? Well, that's, that remains to be seen, I guess. But um, you know, I, I think the, the thing you're talking about is those you know, chats around the water cooler, right? So yeah, a lot of um, work and a lot of innovation happens in those chats around the water cooler. It's not so much that you get together and you have a meeting and, uh, and that's kind of your work day. It's about going around, going to the office, having a coffee with your friends. And then you know, during that conversation with someone from a completely different department, you, know, you might have this genius idea that the two of you come up with and it becomes something bigger. And that's the type of thing that's going to potentially be missing going forward if everything becomes a, um, uh, a remote work scenario. And I think this is where um, companies need to be uh, and businesses need to be very careful in how they design their back to work. You, you can't have it so that people never come back to the office. I, I don't think that's ever going to work. Sooner or later, uh, the, the innovation of the company is going to go down um, because people aren't having those spontaneous conversations. But by the same token, I don't think anyone's ever going to go back to the, the office, or not many people will go back to the office full time either. There's a trade off to be had. And I, I think, well, I suspect what's going to happen is you're going to end up with most businesses where it's possible having people come in two or three days a week and work from home two or three days a week. Uh, and it's that striking that balance, which is going to be the tricky thing going forward. And it, it's funny you say um, you, know, you were in law. Um, 
lawyers are really interesting from this perspective as well because i mean we do we work with a lot of law firms and what you find is in the past a lot of law firms used to differentiate themselves um, by having offices not so much in the city centers anymore but in um let's call them nice areas that's not, no that's totally true it's true here in hawaii too. yeah and, and this is the thing you know and they were using that as a differentiator to attract talent you know you don't have to go into the city every day of the week you can come out to our really nice office on the beach or wherever it was and those type of businesses are now finding it harder i think to attract talent because no one needs to go to the office anymore anyway you know a lot of people are working from home most of the time so there's a, a bit of a um a downside to those people who were forward thinking previously, uh, you know, they're now finding themselves um, in, in a bit of a, a, a spot because they're not being able to attract that talent that they were going to attract because they weren't in the cities. Whereas the city based law firms are, are doing great. You know, they can um, downsize their office spaces because they're only having people come in one or two days a week. I mean, everyone knows that office space in cities is you know, ridiculously expensive in most cases. So they're saving a fortune. They're getting uh, uh, easier to, to hire in talent because they've got more flexible workspaces. It's a for most of the city-based law firms, it's a, a bonus, you know, moving to this type of scenario. So let me give you a scenario um, that that I wonder about. Um, so if I have a, a conference room full of people, uh, and they are, you know, the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd, and they're looking at each other and arguing with each other, and they're you know, they're engaging on a personal level. It's it's not just one or two people. It's a conference room of people. There's a certain social dynamic in that and a certain you know, atmosphere that allows for cre creativity. You know, even lawyers can be creative. As a matter of fact, lawyers should be creative. You know, so many options and possibilities. Um, <clears throat> so that's one scenario. The other scenario is, oh, and by the way, <clears throat> that conference room has a big whiteboard at one end of it. And law firms are doing that now, uh, or, or a monitor, or both. All kinds of you know fantastic technology is coming into that live conference room, where they're connecting by various uh, broadband connections um, to have conferences with other people in other cities and states and countries to handle global issues. Um, okay, that's so that's one scenario with a meeting in a room. And I'll give you a second scenario where they're meeting in a room, but other people are, are not. <clears throat> other people are on electronic, and, and then now you have you know, 20, 30, 50 people. I mean, I, it's unbelievable how many people can participate in this kind of thing. Um, okay, and then I'll give you the, the final is that nobody is in the room. They are all in little screens, and they are everywhere, and they are mm, collaborating. Some of them get better connection than others but they all can see the, what do you call it, share screen. Um, they all can examine the same documents, uh, um, which gives me, what of those three possibilities gives me the better result for my business? Forget about the cost of rent, you know, forget about parking, all that. I, I want the best, smartest, most creative result. Yeah, it's a an interesting scenario that you bring up. and. I think, uh, I hate to say it, but I think the answer is all of them, uh, depending on what your company culture is like. You know, one of the issues that has been brought up previously is um, this idea of proximity prejudice, um, which is just a fancy name for, you know, people who are actually on site and talking in person um, may have an advantage over those people who are not on site. You know, they might be coming in by a Zoom session like we are today. It, it comes down a lot to whether the, the business has put in place processes to ensure that everyone's voice is equally heard. Um, when you're talking about those, uh, when we're talking about meetings, I don't think it's such a, a massive issue. You know, if it's coming together for a specific reason to have a conversation about something specific, I don't think it makes too much of a difference whether you're there remote or whether you're there in person. I think that where the, the problem comes in, though, is where you, know, you might have an employee that is always remote, who is always connecting via a, a Zoom session or a team session, and they're missing out on the in-between conversations. I think that's where the, the difficulty is going to lie in the future. I think um, you know, your three scenarios would work equally well, um, depending on what you were trying to achieve and what your company culture was like. 
but the bigger problem is going to be where you do have people working remotely who aren't being involved in those chats in between that's when you're going to start seeing problems uh interpersonal problems i guess where people are going to feel left out um they're not going to their voice isn't going to be heard as much and you need to be very very careful about how you um you structure that workplace and how you make sure that those people who are remote are heard so it's not just that the people who turn up to the office every single day if they want to are going to make all the decisions and have all the input in those decisions mm, that's yeah. that's going to be the big trick going forward i mean technology is great you know technology can do anything um and these days with you know, decent broadband pretty much everywhere. Uh, the advent of Teams and Zoom and all the other technology we've got, it's not really a technological problem anymore. Now it's more of a, a people problem and it's managing that people problem. Right. So the whole, the whole um, professional uh, technique of management has changed. And I want to, uh, I want to ask you about that. Um, you know, now in, in ThinkTech, our company, right, we, we used to do, we, first we did Skype and then we had a studio. So we did both. We went sort of hybrid. And then we got into Zoom because we, Zoom we found was more appropriate for us. And then we were hybrid. And then, then COVID came and we became completely, you know, Zoom. Nobody comes to the studio except the engineers who operate the broadcast machines, which is, you know, has worked out very well. I mean, I feel that I'm getting to know you more better and even if we had a lunch together, honestly, um, and I really appreciate that. But but you're right about the gap, the vacuum between the meetings. And my question to you is, has the role of making an old fashioned telephone call changed? Has the role <laughs> has the role of, um, of, of of email changed? Has the role of texting and other kinds of you know, social media connection? Has that changed? Um, because it seems to me that if you want to fill the gaps, those are ways you can fill the gaps and, and keep everybody on the same page, even without having a virtual video experience. Uh, yes, it definitely has. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but in my personal experience, I found that in the past, I, I used to find that, um, you know, chat, email, those type of methods, uh, you were always expected almost to be replying instantaneously. And everyone used to complain about that because that's not really how it was meant to work. Um, I think what's happened though is over the past couple of years, as we've gone to this completely electronic means of, um, of meeting with each other and interacting with each other, it's changed slightly in that that, um, that immediate response is mostly going to come from the video meetings. Whereas there's not so much of a, um, a requirement anymore to be on the email two seconds after it's been sent to you. You can sit there, you can have a think about it, and you can reply back to it. And this has become something that is common across a, a lot of companies that I've come across. The, the best thing about this is that, yes, it, email is becoming, uh, and chat is becoming a way of filling in those gaps to a certain extent. The good thing, though, is that because you're not really expected in a lot of cases to be replying to it immediately, you do have that time to consider what you're going to say. And you get much richer and deeper interactions, I think, over email and, and chat as well. So, yeah, to a certain extent, you're right. Uh, those mechanisms are going to fill those in-between gaps to a certain extent. I'm just not sure, though, that you're ever going to have that exact experience though of you know sitting next to someone and just leaning over to say oh you know can i just ask you about blah 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 because you know th th that costs you nothing right it's um it's a, a spur of the moment thing that you can just do whenever you want whereas even writing an email or sending a chat message requires that you sit there and type something so the volume of those interactions is going to go down regardless if you stick with only electronic methods now this being said though i, mean, I guess we're still in the early days, right? I mean, it's been two years um, and people are probably getting a bit sick of uh, working from home after two years completely. But in two years is not a massively long length of time to figure out what the impacts of this are going to be moving forward. And it could be that uh, as we adapt to the, the new, uh, well, hybrid work environment, I guess, that there'll be other changes to how we interact electronically that mean that you know how we used to work with teams for argument's sake 
um, may be completely different. You know, maybe maybe it will turn into that type of scenario where I want to have a quick uh, ask a quick question to my friend over here. I'll just press the button and just see if they're there. Maybe that will happen. I haven't seen it yet, but there are still changes happening. I think we're still going to see an evolution over the next couple of years at least as to how people are going to work. And as companies make the decision to um, to move back into their offices, either part-time or full-time, I don't think that those changes they're making are going to be set in stone either. You know, this is a giant experiment. We're going to be experimenting with this for the next few years or so, and mm -hmm. it's going to be really interesting to see where the vast majority of companies end up. I, mean, I suspect that it is going to be a, a hybrid where people are only going to go in two or three days a week, and we're going to try and fill in all those gaps electronically, but it's really hard to say. You know, after 9-11, the U.S. Uh, government uh, wanted to do a, a more robust attempt at uh, finding terrorists, okay? And, and they went out into the corporate community and they hired a bunch of fellows who had been, and girls, who had been involved in something called the social network anal analysis, social networking analysis. And, and these, these people were uh, adept and, and developing skill in uh, examining keywords in emails. And uh, and and the federal government, you know, in, in uh, expressing the Patriot Act and all those black box, uh, you know, snooping things they did in the early 2000s, uh, they hired these fellows. They hired these fellows uh, from the business community to do the same kind of technology. They were good at examining a corporation, uh, looking at the original schematic for management. And, and then looking at the email that was going back and forth, there's sort of an invasion of privacy here, I think, uh, and looking at all that email and then doing an alternative schematic of the real way, the real management of the company. And, you know, I suggest to you that um, that's where we are. I mean, whether you, you snoop or not, if you, if you do an analysis of the communications going between people now, as opposed to a few years ago, you find out that the real power, the real management and action authority uh, in a given company, same company, is different um, because of the technology. Uh, and you can identify how it works. You can see who the real influencers are. Am I right? Have you have you seen that? Oh, 100%. And I think this is one of the, uh, the interesting side effects of uh, remote working. Because we're doing everything electronically, everything... I wouldn't call it really tracked, but everything can be um, uh, put in a box and you can say, well, you know, this box has grown from this to this and you can get a much better grasp on, on what people are doing and who is doing what as well. So you get a better idea as to who the best communicators are in the business. You get an idea as to, you know, a, a perfect example is um, we can see from our software that there are really strong preferences for when people do and don't want to come to the office, which you would never have known before. You know, you can guess this type of stuff, but I mean, who would have thought people don't want to come to the office on Monday and Friday? You know, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, intu intuitive, I guess. But now there's a lot of data that actually says, yeah, people don't want to come to the office on Monday and Friday. They're really happy to come in on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Thursdays, yeah, a little bit. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, finding out people's preferences from the software that they're using is one thing, but also looking at how those communication streams work is another. You, know, you look at the volume of email that's going backwards and forwards and who that email is going backwards and forwards to. You can start making a lot more inferences that are a lot more correct just based on looking at you know, the things that people have used, how they've changed using them and what sort of productivity you're getting out of them. There's a wealth of data out there that's going to make a huge difference going forward. Exciting, isn't it? It actually oh, speaks really of exciting. greater efficiencies. Oh, 100%. Uh, the, the efficiencies that uh, you're starting to see, you know, the, the perfect one, as I say, I'm always uh, focused on the, the real estate thing because this to me is enormous. You know, two years ago, I, I don't know about where you are, but where I am, uh, rents in the city were absolutely huge. You know, and going through the roof, there was very little... This is little, Brisbane uh, or all cities in Australia? It, yeah, in, well, in Brisbane. Well, it is all cities, but specifically Brisbane. But um, the rents were huge. Uh, now what you're seeing is that there's... Um, because a lot of businesses were coming up to the end of their, um, their leases, they're saying, well, you know, I don't need 
five floors in the middle of the city anymore. I'll keep one floor and um, we'll get people coming in here, there and everywhere. And you can see the huge changes just based on the differences in rent pricing. You know, the, the rent prices are nowhere near what they used to be because there's a lot more um, uh, availability because a lot of businesses are, are reducing their sizes. And the reason they're doing that is because they now have data that they can look at that says, well, you know, my office has only been 30% uh, full for the past two years. We don't anticipate changing too much in the next two years. So why would we keep five floors when we can do it with one? Um, but that's just one example of where looking at the data that's been generated recently gives you some actionable insights that you can then go and make decisions around the business that make the business much more efficient. And whether that's efficient from a, uh, like a financial point of view or from a, a people point of view, it's, um, there's tons and tons of things that you can now see that have been revealed, I guess, because of this one event. You know, uh, following the real estate market here in Hawaii uh, for a long time, uh, the, the play was, uh, well, we have to have a lease for X feet but we have to be able to give you back some, some footage if we don't need it. And we have to take some additional footage if we need it. So we want options. We want options to give you back, options to take more space. And it was, you know, it was uh, part of the process of negotiating a lease in the first place. And everybody paid a lot of attention to that. But it strikes me that uh, now, um, although certainly, you know, as a, somebody on either side of the transaction, you want to be concerned about the amount of space and make sure that it's the right size. But if you grow or if you shrink, it's not necessarily in the space. If you grow or shrink, it's in the equipment, it's in the technique and in the communication systems. Am I right? It's just not as, the same as it was. Yeah, it's it, that's exactly right. The uh, you, When you look at when you're growing and shrinking, now you're talking more about people rather than... Um, like the people is the primary thing and the things that are, are attached to the people. Um, you know, real estate's just one of them, um, but it's a hard one usually to sort of grow and shrink over time, I guess. It's much more difficult than you know, having to go out and buy a, a couple of laptops or even rent a couple of laptops. Everything's going towards this um, as a service model, I guess, and you know, whether that's employees uh, or the things that are associated with employees. I think real estate's one of the last things that, is going to go to the as a service model. But um, yeah, you're right. It, it's real estate, while it's a huge investment, is not really the focus anymore. It, the, the focus is more around what people you have. And the best thing is, is that now that you're not tethered, I guess, to a geography to a certain extent, you, know, you can go looking further afield for someone who fits perfectly with what you're looking for in your business. Um, and I think that's the other big change. You, know, you can you can go down the route of um, of becoming more specialised in your recruitment because you don't require someone in the office five days a week. You, know, you might only want them there a couple of days every month, and they can fly. You know, I can get on a plane and be in Sydney in a couple of hours from here, and it costs me next to nothing. So you know, you, you're getting a lot of people who are doing that um, uh, almost. I think it's called a nomad existence. You know, they they come <laughs> and go to the office when they want yeah. almost. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's a benefit to everyone. I, I honestly, I can't see too many downsides to where we're going at the moment. And that's worldwide, you know, the US, Australia, Europe. It, it's one of the only trends that you're seeing absolutely everywhere is this trend towards the hybrid environments where you can hire people wherever you want. And it turns out that it's generally cheaper than if you were to hire them and, and keep them in an office. So if I have my systems worked out, and if I'm able to communicate, say, around Brisbane for a number of uh, my staff, um, you know, I have it worked out. It, it's simple and it's, um, it's mobile, it's modular in the sense that, okay, well, now I want to have an office in Cincinnati, okay? The same system would apply. And so now I can recruit worldwide. I can expand my business without even standing up. I can have in Cincinnati and Oklahoma City in Toronto, I can have all these people. So that means that if I have a mind to expand my company, the cost of expansion is, is, is the same as the cost of reaching across to the next neighborhood. Um, yeah. And this makes the development of global corporations a lot easier. Am I right? 
Oh, for the most part, yeah. Uh, I think you know, with the, the caveat that we talked about before of you, you have to um, arrange the business and the interactions so that the people who are working remotely still get enough face time, for lack of a better word. Uh, apart from that one caveat, you're exactly right. There's no reason why you can't go out and find someone uh, in London to do a job for us in Australia. And in fact, that, that's exactly what we've done over the past couple of years. You know, we have a, an employee in London who does the exact same thing as what that employee would have done in Australia. Because of technology, we catch up very regularly. It's um, as long as you've got the processes in place to ensure that those interactions with those people are going to be valuable and that they're not going to feel like uh, they're an addendum to the business, then yeah, you can hire anyone anywhere and it, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Now, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when I can um, yeah, just head over to Hawaii for a few days and work from Hawaii. I mean, <laughs> that sounds wonderful to me. Yes, and why not? Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I know. And there's literally no reason why I couldn't. Uh, all, all of my work is done on a laptop or an iPad. I can chuck it in a backpack and I can do exactly the same thing that I'm doing now from Hawaii or from London or wherever. Well, it's, it's, it, we alluded to this before, but uh, that means, doesn't it, that the role of the manager in this new office world has changed. There were certain things that perhaps weren't as uh, high priority before that become high priority now and vice versa. Um, can you talk about that? Can you talk about how the role and the life, if you will, <laughs> the daily existence um, of the manager has changed the new, the new office work? I think that the, the major difference is the, the manager needs to be more cognizant of having those valuable interactions. Um, when everyone was in the office and it was easy enough just to lean over the cubicle next door and say hi, it's, it's not quite that spontaneous anymore. And I, I think as a manager, it, it's important that I'm aware of what everyone's doing, obviously, which is quite easy to do these days. There are a lot of tools that can keep you up to date with where someone is on a particular task, but you also need to have uh, uh, some sort of relationship with the people who work for you. And you have to make sure that they're happy and that they, they don't have issues that they're keeping to themselves that are stopping them from uh, completing their tasks. And I think that's the trick. You know, that, that's the, the thing that managers are going to have to get used to is putting uh, conscious effort into having conversations with all of their employees. And whether that's in a, a group Zoom session or whether it's in a one-to-one -one, uh, conversation on Teams or, or whatever, it's, it's going to depend on the type of environment that you're in. But that's the number one change that needs to happen. There are also a couple of other things. You, know, you need to make sure that um, uh, workplace health and safety, for instance, you know, it's much harder to do workplace health and safety when everyone's at some other site. You, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you're aware of what you, where your employees are working and how they're working with their safe. Um, there are issues around, um, you know, if you've got new employees as a manager, uh, onboarding a new employee as a manager can be significantly harder, uh, especially if they are remote. So uh, I, I remember when I first started here, it was a, a good few weeks before I got to understand who everyone was and where everything was. And um, it's that much harder now that you're working remotely to, to create those links between people. And that, that's one of the roles of the manager as well, is to make sure that when you are hiring someone new, that they're aware of who's who in the zoo and that you make those introductions and that people are having those conversations. Otherwise, you might end up after a couple of months that the person who's just started with you might leave because they don't feel part of the team. And that's probably one of the hardest things as a manager is to make sure that when you are bringing new people in, that they, they feel that um, sense of connection with their colleagues. Yeah. Well, I, you know, not a day goes by these days and we don't read about um, <clears throat> all these people who are leaving their jobs uh, these days. And I, you know, I don't fully understand how that works. I, I have to say that Sometimes it sounds silly to me, but they are, and that's a culture point of our times. Uh, so it seems to me that the manager has to has to see everyone as a, a part of a group and make sure that the connections are not only between the manager and the individual, but between all the individuals outside, that they should have, um, what do you want to call it, a, a collective cultural social experience, because that's what holds people, doesn't it? 
Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I think yeah, the French call it esprit de corps, right? It's the uh, the, the the group uh, spirit, um, and that I think that's the hardest thing to maintain when everyone is remote. Uh, there might be a lot of um, additional productivity when people are remote. You know, you don't have people bothering you every five seconds. You can get through a lot more work. But by the same token, you you need to maintain those relationships and you need to build those relationships with new people. And I think it can become a little bit um, uh, tiring, I guess, uh, to try and do that via electronic means, which means that you have to put a conscious effort into doing it. And if it's not driven by management, then I suspect that what would happen is, is it will just fall apart. You know, you'd have some people who are naturally um, outgoing and who want to have those conversations and who will make the effort to, to talk to their colleagues over electronic means. But there are a lot of people, and I'm not criticising them because I'm one of them, who, um, you know, their natural state is that they're not that chatty and um, you know, perhaps they'd rather just get on with their work, yeah. but they lose something over the long run. If, if you don't have those interactions. And that's where I think management does need to step in and make sure that that, that esprit de corps stays within the business. And that comes down to making sure that people are having conversations and they're, they're forming those relationships and bonds within the workplace. Yeah. Different set of skills, a different set of objectives, yeah. <laughs> one, one other thing in terms of uh, looking at a case study, if you don't mind, is, and by asking you this, I hope to uh, examine all the other things that you deal with in terms of new trends and directions uh, in the office the design development um, world. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm your client. Okay? I, I come in and I say, look, I'd like to establish a new company uh, in Brisbane. And let's say, let's make me a tech company. And I, I need a certain um, you know, number of staff and I need, I need a, a certain amount of computing power and so forth. I need to meet with clientele downtown, maybe, who, who have not yet learned the benefits of, of virtual meetings. And so I have to have a presence. And so I'm, there I am sitting in your office face to face or possibly on a, on a virtual connection. And I say to you, Robert, advise me. Tell me what my choices are. Tell me what your advice is in terms of establishing this brand new business. I think that there's two obvious choices here. Uh, the first one is there's a proliferation of um, WeWork type arrangements. Uh, there, there's a lot of them. WeWork's probably the, the biggest example of this where you've got serviced offices. And what I've found with serviced offices is, is that they, um, they're actually really good value in a lot of cases. Um, your WeWork's great because they've got beer fridge over in the corner and that sort of stuff. So your employees love that type of stuff. But it's a very professional... Um, set up and for what you're talking about if you know you're opening a little branch office in another city to either test the waters or just hire a couple of people serviced offices are perfect now you get all the benefits of a um, a proper corporate office um, with a fraction of the cost and they usually look good the other example is though you, you can actually go out and get um much smaller tenancies so you could get yourself a, a sub-tenancy or something from uh someone who's downsizing and still has a bunch of years on their lease and you can get a subtenancy with them. And I think that's the other thing that we're seeing reasonably often is you are seeing a lot of big companies who are uh, downsizing their tenancies and they're subleasing to other companies who are trying to get into that market. So it's a win-win for absolutely everyone. It, it comes down to, I guess, you know, how permanent are these people that you're going to have in those offices? But from the perspective of what you used to do 20 years ago, where you'd have to go out and negotiate a, uh, a long lease uh, and then fit it out with absolutely everything. I, I don't think anyone does that anymore for that type of scenario. It's more of a, you know, I'll take a sub lease, which is probably already uh, fitted out for me. I'll send some people in there and it's very flexible. Flexibility is the big thing that's going to come out of all of this. You know, it is, and you can even see this with some of the, um, the big um, uh, building owners. You know, they're adding a lot more flexibility into their contracts these days because companies are demanding it. They're not going to go with the, the old fashioned types of contracts where you know, you're, you're set for a specific period and it's going to cost you this much and so on and so forth. Flexibility is the key and that's the way it's going to keep going. Anyone who sort of enters into a, a long-term expensive contract for real estate without really thinking hard is probably doing themselves a disservice. 
but yeah, I, I would say in your case, we work. Comes with a beer fridge. Interesting, because we have that in Hawaii. We have that, yeah. And, yeah. and there are yeah. oh, tech everywhere. companies that do that, yeah. Yeah. Last question, because we are running out of time, Robert, and that's this. So office map, interesting idea. Um, and, you know, from the points that we've discussed, the possibilities, the options, the problems and situations and scenarios, it's all very interesting. And query, are, are you alone in the field or in Brisbane and, uh, you know, in other cities in Australia and elsewhere? Do we find a new generation of professionals that are doing exactly what you're doing? And if we're not, will that happen later? Uh, look, there are a number of software vendors like us who provide similar services. I think the difference between uh, Office Maps and some of our competitors are uh, that uh, the, the type of software that we do has been around for a reasonable amount of time. Um, but what we found is that it was only really the top end of town, the, the big Fortune 500s, the, the, the people with a lot of money who could afford the software to manage their environments and allow that flexible working. Uh, they were the only ones who could afford it. Where we come in and where we're slightly different is that we focused very much on specifically managing hybrid work environments, helping businesses to understand how their environment's being used, helping their employees to uh, manage themselves, I guess, when it comes to coming into the office and when they come and when they don't uh, at a very reasonable rate. So we don't have the million and one extra bells and whistles that uh, some of our competitors do, um, simply because most small to medium enterprises don't need them. Um, so yeah, look, it, it's there are others in the market that we're in, um, and there are more coming all the time. Uh, I think with COVID and this this rush to go to a hybrid environment, there will be more companies like us over time coming in. But at the moment. And we're in a, a pretty good spot. You know, we, we have a, a very defined target market. Um, we've got a product that works for them. And, uh, you know, we can't complain at the moment. There's, there's a lot of business. There's nothing so constant as change. Thank you, Robert. Robert Wilkinson, really appreciate you joining us today. I enjoyed meeting you, and I don't think you're shy at all. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. I've, uh, I've been practicing quite a bit and it was great to meet you too. Thanks very much. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.